Good morning. Let me say first that I'm delighted to be here, and I so appreciate the invitation from your president uh, to be here. Uh, Phil and Elaine are dear and treasured long-term friends of ours. It's great to be in their presence. It is also wonderful to be here in this school and to be in your presence. And I so appreciate this invitation and this opportunity to be with you. Let me say, too, that I've been delighted to be a part of the installation of the Reuben Job chair. Uh, Bishop Job is one of my heroes. He was bishop in Iowa when I was at St. Paul, and I got to know him there. So now to have this chair is so, well, it so warms my heart. And part of uh, the pleasure of this is meeting Fred Schmidt. Let's see, which side? Uh, yes. <laughs> and I, I so look forward to your wonderful uh, ministry here. And I also got to meet Billy Wilbur, who was an important, an important figure, her family, in the, in the giving of the chair. She comes from the East Texas Piney Woods, which is where my father comes from, and there is a sample cemetery there that yet exists. So this has just been a wonderful time, and I've got to go to work if we're going to get out of here, and I promise Phil we would. Sarah is transgendered. She had started attending our church, <clears throat> and uh, we were delighted. Our congregation in Phoenix was half gay and lesbian and, and half otherwise, and uh, the, uh, we were multiracially diverse and diverse in class, and so she just added to the richness of that congregational life. After she had been with us two or three years, she stood up during celebrations and concerns and indicated that she had been offered a new job in Houston, Texas, and that she was really pleased because the job would pay more, and it was very clearly an advancement for her. So while we hated to see her leave, nevertheless, we were delighted that she was uh, being appreciated the way she was. So we said our goodbyes, and she left. It would have been six weeks later, maybe two months, she was back at Asbury, our church. And during the celebrations and concerns, she stood and said that she had, she had lost her job, that she had been terminated, that apparently they did not know about her transgendered identity and situation. It was just a, uh, an instantaneous grief across that congregation. Later, we were one of those United Methodist churches where we celebrate the Eucharist every Sunday. And it became the richest part of my worship life, if not of my life. So we came up in the celebrant did the words of institution and the prayer, and then asked Sarah if she would come up to be one of the people to distribute the elements. And so she did, and we gathered, and the time came, and they began to distribute the elements. As Sarah did, she didn't, her eyes did not just fill, they were not just four classic streams of tears. She simply cascaded. Now, I don't mean to essentialize women, okay? But in our church, the folks who tend to carry these little cellophane things with tissues in them, it's the women. And we're lined up to receive the elements. And the women are reaching in their purses or their pockets and they're pulling out these cellophane packages and they're pulling out Kleenex and handing them up and down the line and saying, this is for Sarah. This is for Sarah. 
So as we walk up, this is what we hear. This is the bread of heaven. Blot, 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 blot. This is the heaven, the bread of heaven. Blot, 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 blot. You know, the poet says, the poet says that the world does not end with a bang. It ends with a whimper. I think that's wrong. I think it ends with a, this is the bread of heaven, blot, 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 blot. This is the cup of salvation, blot, 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 blot. I want to say to you today that as I've been working with the issue, that was an embodiment, that was a performance of justice. It just so happened that at the time that occurred, I was having that opportunity to talk about retirement. I was able to spend a thousand hours on Paul. That's about 25 weeks and I get to read 40 hours a week. It is just, oh my goodness. <clears throat> and I began to work with some people such as J. Lewis Martin and Beverly Gaventa and Doug Campbell and so forth. and, and they spoke to me in a very powerful way about that whole notion of righteousness and the authentic writings of Paul. You know, for Paul, his gospel is a gospel that addresses the captivity, the bondage, the enslavement of the world. We are trapped, we are caught, says Paul, in these, in these powers that have their grips on our lives, the power of death, the power of sin, the powers of the flesh, and then these elemental powers. And Martin, in that magisterial commentary of his own Galatians, he says in there that in the ancient world, the way that they saw the cosmos was that it was structured by these opposites and for example in the ancient world you had the opposite of fire and air I mean sorry earth and air fire and water huh? and that those things they structure the world they're the very the very way in which it's put together what is so interesting in Paul's gospel is that he has a different set of pairs of opposites and this is this is Martin's claim. And that indeed for Paul, when he talks about the structuring of the world in terms of those pairs of opposites, he talks about Greek and Jew, slave or free, male and female. And in Paul's thought, what God has done in Christ is God has come into the world in Christ and has crucified, he says at one point, the cosmos, because what he has done is taken down the walls. In the economy of God, the walls no longer count. And we are free, free to live in a new creation. Now for Paul, I love him because I think he's actually concrete. My father used to get me, when I first learned to read, he'd ask me to come in and read the Bible to him. Well, he liked me to read either the Gospels or the Psalms because he couldn't understand Paul. Well, I understand that, but <clears throat> when Paul talks about the new creation, he's talking about the ecclesia. This may scare you. It scares me. He's talking about the church. And he says because of what God has done, God calls us to live into that new creation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Huh? And that means we are given the grace, the freedom to live into that and to declare the walls down. Hmm. Now, I believe that when Paul talks about rectification, he's talking about a God who sets things right. And those Dikaio words relate to that whole issue of justice. 
And what I'm trying to suggest, and I'm having to do this fast. <laughs> I've got a clock there. I need to watch it. <laughs> what I'm trying to suggest is that, that I think we need to be very explicit about a Christian understanding of justice that grows precisely out of what God has done in Jesus Christ. We're in a culture, in a nation state, that tends to want to peripheralize religion. That's a part of that theory, that ideology, the development of the nation state. We'll go into that another time. And what we say to people often, John Rawls said it in his wonderful book in 1971 on justice. He said, if you're going to speak in the public, you need to speak in public discourse, not in the language of your personal faith. I want to contend against that. In Phoenix, I was in one organization that had 25 faith traditions. And what I discovered there was a richness in terms of addressing the issues before us. And I think to quiet those voices once one moves into the public arena is to miss that richness and to fail to hear people who come out of a deep coherence in their own faith tradition, more about the other in a moment. But for now, that. So we're called to live into that new creation. And that, that act, that righteousness, that rectification brought by God in Christ is, I contend, the centrality for a Christian understanding of justice. And I think when Sarah stood at that table of Eucharist, and people began to reach out to her and to tell her, dear, finally, ultimately, that wall is down. That was an act of justice. It's also an act of truth. Now, I know you say, wait a minute, Sam, well, the walls are down? Huh. You've been outside lately? Did you hear that litany of unfairness he presented to me to deal with in 45 minutes? <laughs> but remember this about Paul. With Paul... There's always this already, not yet. It's happened, but it hasn't happened fully yet. It's happened, but it'll only happen finally huh? when Christ comes again. So that already, not yet. Um, Mike, uh, uh, hmm. Kavanaugh, his book, Migrations of the Holy, and I've dropped his first name. And in that book, he deals with this issue of the already not yet. And one of his students, the student's name was Mark Asbury. Got to be a Methodist in there somewhere. <laughs> huh? His student reminds him of the opera Ariadne on Noxos. I don't know if you know that. In that opera, it, it, it has this kind of a storyline. The richest man in Vienna, he's planned a party and a celebration. So he's invited numerous guests. And he's got an agenda planned for the evening. First, they're going to hear this tragedy, this tragedy about Ariadne on Noxos. Noxos is a deserted desert island. She, her lover, has died. And she's gone to that deserted desert island to await her own death and grief and suffering. That's the tragedy. But the owner of the house, he is not happy with the fact that they're going to have a celebration that's going to end in tragedy. So he plans a second performance, this time by Zerbinetta and her troop of harlequins, nymphs, and buffoons. All right. Only that's going to be second. And then third, there will be the fireworks. Right. Well, he's concerned, that is the owner of the house, is concerned about the length of time it's going to take to do the tragedy, and then the comedy, and then the fireworks. He's afraid they won't get to the fireworks. Now, the composer of the tragedy is outraged. He is outraged because you're going to do my tragedy before a comedy? Well, it gets worse. It gets worse. The uh, 
the master of the house decides, you know, we don't have time to do all three. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have a mix of the comedy in with the tragedy. <laughs> huh? With the tragedy. So can you imagine how the composer felt about that? And so that's what they do. And what happens is Zerbinetta, with her harlequins, her nymphs, her buffoons, any relationship between that and United Methodist Church is purely coincidental. <laughs> but as the tragedy goes on, huh, the comedians, they constantly infiltrate the tragedy. The comedians come in and they improvise. Oh, there's a great line about her. They say that Zerbinetta, she is a mistress of improvisation because she always plays herself and therefore she's at home in scenes of every kind. And so the comedians continually interrupt the tragedy. They, uh, and they improvise. That just sounds to me like what we're about. We are the comedians. And something has happened and in the tragedies of the world, and I know they are wicked, but in the tragedies of the world, we need somebody who says, who interrupts, who infiltrates, who says, this story ain't over. And we are the people who are called, called to live into that kind of ecclesia, that kind of community. Now, to be sure, let me just say what I think that looks like in terms of justice as, re as rectification understood in terms of God's act in Christ. I think one thing it means is that, <clears throat> is that justice is a matter of redemption. Justice understood as redemption in a liberation sense because Paul's gospel is a liberating gospel, setting people free from the captivities of the world. Some of you will know Bob McLean. He teaches preaching and worship at Wesley Theological Seminary, and Bob and Joanne and Peggy and I are good friends. We spent a, several days at their house here some years ago, and one afternoon Bob says to me, uh, Tex, I've got a, uh, an engagement I not only need to go to, I want to go to tonight, and I." I'm just wondering if you and Peg would want to go with Joanne and me or whether you'd rather stay here. Well, what are you doing? They said, well, there is this, uh, there's this wonderful woman. Her name is Indacia, which means driver, he said. Indacia Adame Holland. And she's a poet and a writer, and she's reading her poetry at a friend's house, and we're going, I see. And he said, by the way, she's from Greenwood, Mississippi. I said, well, let me talk to Peggy, but I got a hunch we want to go. <laughs> we went. Oh, tall, poised, articulate, wonderful poetry. She begins to read about the Delta and the Mississippi River and pine trees, not in the Delta, but she's seen them. Pea gravel floating in a creek, you know, rushing through a creek. And I mean, I'm home. After a time, she comes to a moment for a break. And we take a break. And Bob turns aside to me and says, what do you think of the fact that when that woman was 17 years old, she was a prostitute working the streets of Greenwood, Mississippi? You're lying. I am not lying. Yes, you are. You're just lying. No, I am not. Why don't you go ask her? What? <laughs> I'm not going to go ask her. You're afraid. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid. I'm just not. That's, not a, that's an insensitive question. You're afraid, mother. Mother's half a word to Bob, okay? <laughs> he said, you're scared. You just won't go. Well, that's... That's kind of a red flag to me, you know. So I go up there. 
嗨，嗨。My name's Tex. I, I'm a friend of Bob's. I see. Yes, I, I know Bob. Yes, I love Bob. I do too. He's a wonderful man. Yes, thank you. Uh, Bob and I were having a talk. I mean, just a minute ago, and I, I wanted to know if. Well, he, he said that. That we were talking about your former employment. <laughs> you mean that I was a prostitute in Greenwood, Mississippi when I was a teenager? Oh, dear God, yes. It's true. Really? Oh, yes. It's true. How did you get from there to here? She said, oh, it's very simple. The Civil Rights Movement. I said, wait a minute, I was in the Civil Rights Movement. I was heavily engaged, but I, I don't know how that could do it. She said, in the Civil Rights Movement, I heard for the first time that I was black and I was beautiful. I said, well, that's true. But I still don't know how that would be enough. She said, if you've never heard it before, you'd be surprised how powerful it is. And then I began, she's got a wonderful book. You want Preachers, there are stories <laughs> in the book. <laughs> I began to read her book and just to watch that story unfold. She follows Bob Moses, that great organizer in Greenwood back in the early 60s. She follows Bob Moses to the, to the office where SNCC is operating. According to Charles Payne, SNCC was a good outfit in the early 60s. It kind of lost its way later. She is propositioning Bob Moses all the way. He says, why don't you just come on with me? Why don't you work with us? And he invites her in. And the first thing they do is give her a desk and put her to work. Martin Luther King Jr. comes and she spends time with him. <sighs> I gotta go, I gotta uh, stop that, except say this, King says to her, always put God first in your life. And she says, Dr. King, I will. <laughs> Folks, that is the justice of liberation. And that kind of liberation is intrinsic to a Christian justice. There's also the issue of mercy. We often think of mercy somehow in tension with justice. I want to contend that mercy understood in terms of God's righteous act in Christ, that mercy is intrinsic. It is at the very center of the very heart. A God of kenosis, or a God who, a God who did not count equality with God, a Christ who did not count equality with God, a thing to be possessed, but emptied self. Or then that wonderful line, while we were yet enemies, God reached out for us. Reconciliation. I got stories for all these things, but we don't have time. We're going to keep moving, okay? The reconciliation. This is the God who through Christ is reconciling self to the world. And I remember as Sarah stood there with the tears running down her face, I kept saying, reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation. This is right. This is right. This is what it is. This is just a sample. Get your head around it. Or, or how many of you remember the the story of the Amish, the school shooting, the Nichols Mine School. And they shot and killed so many of those Amish children. And do you remember how the Amish ecclesia responded to that? Oh my. They extended forgiveness to the husband, forgiveness of the husband to his widow. He was killed, if you remember. Not only that, they attended 
his funeral. They invited her as a respected guest to the funerals of their own children. And I understand a good deal of money came into those families and they shared it. They shared it with the widow of the shooter. That's ecclesia. That's saying the wall is down. That's living out the faith of Christ under the power of the Spirit. Now, we live in a world with other people, okay? No question about that. People of other faith traditions and people of no faith tradition. Now, <clears throat> when you begin to look at the New Testament, it's always a very dangerous thing to do. That's also true of the Hebrew text, but I don't have time for that today. I'm intrigued by the way in which Jesus treats people who are other. Do you know when Jesus wants to tell us what love is like, who does he talk about? He talks about the good Samaritan. We learn what love is from somebody who is other, somebody outside the faith. Oh my goodness, that, that story of the centurion in Luke 7, Remember, he, he sends some, he, he meets with the elders. And if you've been to Israel, you've probably seen that synagogue that now rests on the synagogue, which they say he helped to build. All right. They say he's a good person, the centurion. He loves our people. All right. But he sends some elders to Jesus to ask him to come. But before they can come, he then sends others to tell Jesus, no need to come. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to, to, to meet with you. But I'm a military man. Now look, if you just say the word, you give the order, my servant, my slave will be well. You can heal my slave simply by giving the word. Loose translation, but reasonably accurate. Jesus hears this story, and he says, I have never seen such faith in all of Israel. This is centurion. This is a soldier in an oppressing foreign enemy. And Jesus says, we learn about faith through him. I don't know what you do with a Canaanitic woman. The Syrophoenician woman is a parallel story but the Canaanitic woman, Canaanitic woman, she's got a daughter that's got a demon. She's other. She's a foreigner. And she asked Jesus to heal her daughter. And Jesus says what seems to me the hardest thing, or at least one of the hardest things he ever says in the Gospels. He says, I'm called to the household of Israel. You don't give bread to dogs. She says, yes, but the master will allow the dogs to eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says, well, and Jesus then heals daughter. What do you make of that? Did she correct Jesus? If you won't accept that, did she challenge Jesus? Jesus changed. He may not have changed his mind. I don't know about his mind, but he changed what he did. You don't suppose that we learn about love and faith and receive challenges that make us change from people who are other? I love what George Hunsinger says. He says, the Christ who is Lord is at the center of our faith. But that same Christ is also at the margins. And to lose either of those is to lose the Christ. You see, you've got this peculiar problem we have, and that is 
that the kingdom or the reign of God is wider than the church. I don't know, when it comes to other faith traditions, I simply cannot tell them that God has not revealed self to them. Can you? I don't know. I, I, now, let me be clear. I believe that God is centrally Christic. Hmm? I believe what God has done in Christ is unsurpassed, unsurpassable. But at the same time, I am not able to say to somebody, God has not, oh, let's put it the other way. I'm not going to say to God, God, you didn't reveal self to them. That is above my pay grade. Huh? That's above my pay grade. So we're in a world with others. That puts us in a question in. See, I want to, I want to be on the side of a distinctive Christian justice because I think that's where God has acted. I think that's the God who's called us into ecclesia. I think that's a God who's powerfully at work in our lives and calling us. I'm also struck, though, that this is a God who speaks through and speaks to those who are other. And that's where I began to work with the question of how do you work with the common good with people of other faith traditions? With Paul for just a minute. Uh, Vic Furnish, who's one of my heroes, love Vic Furnish. He's done this wonderful paper on the common good and the uncommon love of God with Paul. And I can't go into all that, but one of the things he says, he says, Paul does not appeal for his ecclesia to join in public dialogue about the common good. Not even the common good as a concept is one that Paul employs. Nevertheless, says Vic, the uncommon love of God enacted in Jesus Christ nourishes a concern for the common good and opens the way for participation in public conversation. For the past 13 years, up until just this last year, I've been involved with an Industrial Areas Foundation uh, mass-based organizing effort in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. One of the truly uh, rich, rich moments of my life. And what I've, what I've seen there is the way in which people can come together with what we so often call radically different interests. People can come out of positions that seem like they are not negotiable. But I have found time and again, and when people sit down and start to tell their stories to each other and get to know each other, suddenly there's a, there can be, it's not automatic, there can be a transformation of those kinds of interests. And then people, people begin to work together in ways that are just incredible, just incredible, quickly. This immigration business was really tough in Arizona. So bad, we had a sheriff, I won't go there. But we had a chief of police and we went to see him a number of times. And one of the things he said, look, he says, look, if I do immigration policy for the federal government, I cannot protect the people of Phoenix. He said, I feel like it's a lot more important for me to deal with violent crime than it is for me to be reinforcing the policies of the immigration people. So we worked and talked for a while, and one of the things we discovered was that a truly criminal element would take over a neighborhood because they knew that the people there would not call the police because they had neighbors or friends or relatives who were themselves undocumented and might be arrested. So the only thing that seemed to work was we began to do neighborhood walks with the chief of police, if you can imagine. You'd do that here in Chicago, I'm sure. And, and we had a guy named Chief Yonner. And, uh, we did a neighborhood walk with him one day, and it wouldn't have been two weeks later. A woman that we knew and were working with, she heard a disturbance next door, and it was a man beating up his wife. So she called the police. She had been instructed to do that. And the police came, but they arrested her husband. She did not have, you know, a lot of facility with English and was not able to communicate adequately. It's not my husband, it's the man next door. 
They arrest her husband, and they're taking him out the door. Huh? She runs back into the house, and she's got one of Chief Yonner's cards. And she runs after the police and says, Call! 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 They call the chief. He says, Hey, she's one of our ours. Let her go. By then, they've got somebody that can translate. And he says, no, it's the guy next door. Those kinds of things happen when people get on the ground with real people telling stories and working together to work for a common good. Um, <clears throat> now, quickly, quickly, quickly. Um, To be a just people in the Christian tradition requires formation. And I want to say something to the students out here. I very much celebrate a great deal of this contemporary technological capacity. I really do. I want to say the other part, too. If you think you can do a theological education online, My question, <clears throat> my question to you is, how do you get formed in Christ? Do not cheat yourself out of formation in Christ in a community of scholarship and learning that's also devoted to piety. Hmm. You see, without formation, all you're left with is the freedom of choice. My friend Gene Lowry plays the piano. He's a wonderful jazz pianist. I can't play anything. My choices with the piano are infinite, as it's so popular to say in a consumer's culture. All of my options are open. I have the freedom of choice. He has the freedom of capaciousness. Which one do you want? Our son was celebrating his 50th birthday. Dear God, a 50-year-old son. <laughs> we have him and his daughters come to the house, and Peggy and I are preparing some steak and some chicken. And I've got a big platter of this meat, and uh, one of the things I do is burn meat at our place. <laughs> We've got a Weimaraner dog whose name is Jazz. And Jazz discovers where you're going to go when you leave the house. And that dog is smart enough, she figures out how you're going to come back. She laid down on the path I had to come across going back to the kitchen after burning the meat outside. I come in with a platter like this, and I am walking across the floor, and I cannot see the floor. I put one foot down and I lift that right foot and with my toe I catch her belly cage and I fall straight forward with a pan of meat. Now there's a corner of the house there and I, with this arm I caught that corner to break my fall a bit. It put a bruise from here to here and I fell flat on my face with the pan out here. And I did not drop a single piece of meat. I, I get up. Peggy, Peggy does not understand that I am bulletproof. It's a bone of contention. I know I'm not, but I think I am. Do you know what I mean? I walk over to the sink and I put the platter down on the sink. And Peggy says, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. I just fell down. No, you don't look like you're all right. What do you mean I don't look like I'm all right? I'm fine. No, you don't look like you're here. I'm thinking. Thinking? What on earth are you thinking about? I can't figure out why I didn't drop the meat. She says, you're in shock. Huh? I am thinking. 
And as I think, why didn't I drop the meat? It hits me. Catching. Catching. Ran in college. I figured it out. We only played two games a week. If you pitch one, you can't play the next game. So I started catching so I could play both games. See? And one of the things you do in catching is that you must hold on to the ball when you get run over. I have been knocked from here to the back row. Okay, I can testify to that. All right. One of the ways that they teach you not to drop the ball is that they throw you a soft toss. Why soft? It's harder to catch. They throw you a soft toss. Somebody stands here with a big pillow. And the instant the ball hits your mitt, they take that pillow and they go, bam! Huh? I mean, they let you have it. And so you do that over and over and over again. You see, the explanation is to release the grip, get hit. That trains you to. I have seen catchers, not me, I've seen catchers knocked out who held on to the ball. That is formation. If we're going to have people in the church who are committed to justice, who are committed to the gospel in all kinds of ways, today we're talking about justice, but there are other things too. If we're going to have those kinds of folks, we have got to be formed. We've got to be formed not only embodied as people of the ecclesia of God, but we've got to be formed as people who know the practices of reaching out to people who are truly other in that community and thereby to pursue the common good. I think I've got two minutes. Greg Jones tells a wonderful story of Maggie. All right. Maggie was caught in the Burundi Civil War. She now has a place called Maison Shalom in Ruyigi, Africa. When that war broke out, you remember it went from 1993 to 2005, and it's had an outbreak since. Maggie, Maggie's village was first assaulted by the Hutu militia. And they, mass <clears throat> and they massacred, massacred most of Maggie's extended family. <clears throat> she escaped with her seven adopted Hutu and Tutsi children. As you may know, those were the warring, among the most powerfully warring groups. She found refuge in a Hutu compound with a Catholic bishop. Then it was the Tutsi who came. They stripped her, they tied her, they forced her to watch the massacre of 72 people. Fortunately, she found her adopted children hiding in the sacristy of the church. Maggie believes that our identity is in the image of God within us and that it is more important than being Hutu or Tutsi. And she believes that God's love is more powerful than hatred and violence. So she went to work on the common good. She built, she and they, built a health clinic, a school, business training and hairdressing, auto mechanics, sustainable agriculture. She says she believes in the power of God, please note the word, to foster reconciliation. She has a holistic understanding of salvation. They built a swimming pool. She said, we wanted to cleanse the imagination of the violence, and we wanted to immerse them in an alternative, joy-filled imagination. They built a theater. It even had theater seats in it. Some rebel soldiers came to burn it down. Maggie says, now, 
one of the practices to learn in the, in the ecclesia is fluency. Yeah, I believe in walking the talk, but you better be able to talk the talk if you're going to be ordained in this church. Fluency is crucial. What she said was, well, I sure can't stop you from burning it down. I wonder, though, would you like to see a movie before you do? Hmm. Well, maybe. So she showed them a movie. And they decided, well, maybe we won't burn it down right away. The town now has a hospital and a nursing school, and it has a morgue. Maggie says it teaches people to live, to live by taking care of the dead. A man came to kill her. He had been living in the bush. His assignment was to murder her. Fluency. Once again, she said, well, I sure can't stop you. But I do wonder, do you get tired of living in the bush? Do you get tired of being filled up with hate and violence all the time? Maybe she said, do you get tired of being sick and tired? <laughs> huh? I need a driver, she said. How about leaving the bush and coming here and being my driver? I think a Christian, a distinctively Christian approach to justice opens an amazing door to working with people for a justice of the common good. And I can't imagine a society or a world that needs that any more than we.